Uh, okay, great, John, you're ready. <laughs> so um, our next talk uh, is by John Weaver. Thank you. You are muted though, yeah. Can you hear me now? Fantastic, Yeah. thanks. Uh, hi everyone, my name is John Weaver. I'm a final year PhD student at the Cosmic Dawn Center here at the University of Copenhagen, supervised by Professor Suna Toft. I'm gonna to take a few moments of your time today to talk about beasts in the bubbles, measurement of the massive end, or should I say luminous end of the redshift greater than eight UV luminosity function. I wanna thank the organizers for allowing me to, or giving me the opportunity to present this work today and also to my collaborators without whom this work was surely not be possible. As many of you may know, the Cosmos 2020 uh, catalog is, is nearing completion, nearing uh, publication and release. It is a near infrared selected catalog of about a million galaxies over the two square degrees of the Cosmic Evolution Survey. Just to give you a sense of, of these images, on the right hand side, I show an RGB image of the near infrared bands, where you can just get a sense of the, the density of sources in these ground based images and also the diversity of, of galaxies and sources that we can find. Compared to Cosmos 2015, Cosmos 2020 reaches significantly deeper depths than most of our bands. Notably in the optical bands, thanks to the HSC uh, SSP DR2 release, providing even deeper GRIZY um, uh, bands, which of course is important for removing low redshift interlopers from otherwise high redshift samples, and as well uh, increasing in depth in the near infrared bands, allowing us to have more mass complete samples and pushing that mass completeness to higher redshift. The catalog is constructed with two photometric codes. One is classic. This is basically the same strategy as in our previous catalog in 2015. It utilizes source extractor for source detection and photometry, and then uses IRAC clean, a PSF fitting uh, software to do the IRAC photometry. In contrast, we use a, a new tool called the Farmer, um, which utilizes parametric models to fit sources using, uh, uh, so it's wrapped around the tractor, which is a software code written by Dustin Lang and David Hogg. Uh, the difference is that now flux and position are now full model parameters. This gives us sensitivity to ultra faint sources and precise to blending. What I mean by that is on the right hand side, I show two galaxies that are very nearby. It's a pathological case where even two arc second apertures cannot hope to separate their fluxes. However, we see that by developing a model for these galaxies, we're able to uh, very easily and robustly uh, separate their fluxes to blend the sources. And then we can take these same models that we've derived on these higher resolution images and apply them to lower resolution images, such as IRAC, which is of course valuable for all of our high redshift restroom optical science, where we can now get an even better idea about uh, the fluxes that we can measure there. Uh, the farmer also provides free fitting and residual statistics, shapes and sizes, um, which are of course useful as well. Each of the two photometric catalogs is paired both with two photometric redshift codes, LaFar and Easy. So on the right hand side, I show um, uh, the performance of the photo photometric redshifts on the Y axis versus the spectroscopic uh, redshifts on the X axis for the classic version on the top and then the farmer version on the bottom for four bins of magnitudes going from 17th to 27th magnitude with all the usual statistics. We find unprecedented photometric accuracy uh, between classic and the farmer uh, and the difference between the redshift codes is really uh, minimal. And so overall we achieve a, a sigma n mat less than 1% on the bright end with a sigma n mat less than 5% on the faint end with a low bias and low failure rate. And so importantly, we get uh, four photometric redshifts for all of our sources. And I note that for those of you uh, looking at this even more carefully, you'll see that the statistics are slightly better for the farmer on the faint end, which has implications for how we go about doing our high redshift science with the Cosmos 2020 catalog. So of course, in an audience like this, I don't need to convince anyone that uh, looking at larger co-moving volumes is important for our science. Uh, right, because environments dense enough to support the most massive galaxies are found only in the largest and deepest surveys, which makes Cosmos 2020 over its two square degrees a valuable survey to look for in, er in order to understand the epoch of reionization. Of course, we'll get to the, the, the core of the matter here. I thank the previous speakers for doing such an excellent job of, of uh, providing all the background for this, so I can just jump right in. 
So we provide new constraints on the first ultraluminous galaxies to the UV luminosity function. This is a paper um, by Olivier Kaufman, uh, which is in PrEP. We find 31 galaxy candidates at a redshift greater than 7.5 over the 0.8 square degrees of the ultra deep region of Cosmos 2020. We also find, importantly, new sources only found with the model-based photometry from the farmer. And this is because the apertures in the optical bands are crowded with ne ne yeah, neighboring blue sources, which force uh, a low redshift solution mistakenly. So just to give you a baseline, here's our redshift 8 UV luminosity function with the red point shown here. We know from all the, the previous discussions on, on HST-based uh, pencil beam survey based UV luminosity functions that we have, you know, this, this uh, shape on, or, you know, uh, the, the data on the uh, faint end. And of course, it is the largest surveys that are able to provide the range of environments in order to find these rare, massive, supposedly massive, luminous galaxies, which populate the, the bright end of the UV luminosity function. And so here at Redshift 8, we find excellent agreement with previous works, most notably those of Bowens, Bowler, and Stefanon. But now, we, of course, we can go further into Redshift 9, and we see that uh, we also agree with the work from uh, Bauer, Bowens, and Stefanon. No huge surprises there, especially seeing as this, the data sets are, are very similar. Uh, likewise, we find an excess of these bright uh, sources consistent with this previous work. And so we can, we can fall back on, on the usual discussion about this, right? Could this be that quenching has not begun yet? In other words, the halo quenching has not set in. And in fact, we're seeing uh, a power law like UV luminosity function, which would then betray the initial conditions of the halo mass function from which these galaxies, of course, uh, recently formed. Or uh, as many have, have posed, does dust complicate this picture? Is, is our dust recipes in inadequate? Do we not understand dust production at these redshifts? We also find no evolution of the UV luminosity function uh, normalization, uh, also at these uh, on the bright end, also in, consistent with previous work. So here's redshift 10, for example, and you can see that the normalization didn't change. Um, we're getting basically the same number densities of sources as we go to higher redshift. And so if, if the star formation rate efficiency at redshift 10 is similar to that redshift nine, then of course we really shouldn't find such bright galaxies here. We'd want an increase with number density with time such that we can continue along with the rest of the narrative down to low redshifts. So of course this is surprising. And so while the lensing estimates are too weak in our redshift eight to nine bins to explain away uh, this overdensity and lack of evolution. We find that at redshift 10, with only two sources formally in that bin, uh, the lensing may indeed contribute uh, to, that, to that lack of evolution, in addition, of course, to contamination. It's two sources. Uh, shot noise, of course, is prevalent. Of course, how are we going to answer all these, all these problems? Well, as many of speakers have said before me, we're going to go to JWST. So we have a JWST cycle one proposal, I'm delighted to say, or cycle one program, I'm delighted to say, uh, which I am the PI of, that uh, will perform a detailed spectroscopic study of five ultra robust, ultra luminous galaxies selected from this UV luminosity function work. Of course, they won't be seen in smaller surveys due to the reasons I already illustrated. And we will use deep uh, Y greater than 26 uh, AB spatially resolved spectra from clear prism mode to characterize their mass assembly and star formation. For those of you who are unaware of, of integral field spectroscopy, we're gonna take a source like, like this wonderful Redshift 7 galaxy from Bauer L 2018, and we're gonna turn uh, the Redshift 9 version of it into a full on data cube. So we can study multiple sight lines across the galaxy spectroscopically for the first time. So I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to wrap up here. I want to mention briefly that um, part of a work, uh, part of a, a survey in progress called the Cosmic Dawn Survey. It's a 50 square degrees survey to map the high redshift universe. Uh, importantly, it includes 20 square degrees of the Euclid deep field north and south. Uh, and Euclid will then provide a deep near infrared selection for the survey. Uh, optical imaging, GRIZ optical imaging is already underway from the Hawaii 2.0 program with several papers in preparation, uh, which should be submitted uh, very soon. As well, this work, uh, this survey uh, is supported by the largest Spitzer mission ever at 6,000 hours. This is a Spitzer legacy survey. And again, that paper, Modetti et al., is also in prep. Just to give you a sense of scale, on the right-hand side is, is the uh, Euclid deep field north. 
uh, compared to the Euclid field of view and also compared to candles, just to give a sense of, of difference of just the magnitude um, of the area of the survey. So this is a, a zoom in of the survey, just to give you, just to motivate this whole model-based model based photometric method and the reason why we need to keep developing tools to better understand crowded fields. And so the Cosmic Dawn survey will be a powerful resource for identifying large numbers of redshift galaxies and to, of course, understand the epoch of reionization. So I just want to uh, just finish up on this slide. Uh, thank you for, for listening. Uh, I'm on the job market this year. Please get in touch if you're interested in working together. You can find me on my email here or you can find me on Slack. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, and so if we just uh, wait a few uh, seconds for questions to come in on Slack. Right, so question from Rebecca Bowler. Um, so are the new sources you find that are close to low Z galaxies gravitational events at all? Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that, that exact detail. Very good question, thank you for that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't wanna, say something that's not true. So I'll get back to you on that if that's okay. We have a question from Yuchi Harakani, um, who asks, uh, do these very bright galaxies at redshift greater than eight uh, significantly contribute to the star formation rate density at that epoch? We have not done those calculations yet. Again, this is the, the paper that's in prep is a pretty short work, just focusing on the UV luminosity function. It's also in prep. Um, so that's an excellent thing that we should definitely go out and do, and I hope we do that. Thank you. All right, so the next question is from the Sarah Bosman. Um, for the sources only selected through your improved deep landing, did you investigate how, why the sex tractor version of deep landing is behaving? Yes, the, the sources, these are very small sources, a high redshift, of course. I don't think I need to justify that here but that the uh, two arc second aperture can include multiple of these small sources. And so in, in all cases, visual inspection immediately reveals that the sources were, were deblended in, in the detection step, but that when the aperture was performed, when the force photometry was performed on these bluer bands, uh, the neighboring or this, this neighboring source that was apparent uh, in, in that band shown through. And of course, this high redshift genuine source wasn't there in those blue bands. So yeah, it's entirely due to, to the fact that you just fundamentally can't separate this stuff out uh, with, with apertures right now. One more question, if you can answer it in under a minute. Sure. Um, so are, you're at Mathias. Are any of the redshift greater than eight sources spatially resolved uh, in the K band? As far as I'm aware, no. Uh, these are all unresolved sources, and for sure, um, right? The, the farmer is able to provide shapes for these things, but only if they're they're actually resolved sources, right? Because the parameter the, the parameters of effective radius and shape and whatnot are only going to be valid for sources that are resolved. And so the farmer's main job is to pick out which ones are resolved and which ones are not. And these are all um, I'm sure point source, uh, uh, point source uh, models, and uh, point source um, uh, galaxies. And in fact, if we found it to be the converse, we found them to resolve sources, I think we'd be a lot more skeptical about them. So, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, John. Um, you've got a couple more questions in the Slack, um, so you can go and take your time to respond to those. Um, 